بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا لك الحمد والشكر كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters, young and old, thank you for being here tonight or this afternoon For those who don't know me, my name is Muhammad Abdullah and inshallah ta'ala I would like to be holding these series of lectures so this is not a one-off uh, we will probably be going maybe at least for six months every Saturday unless or until or if I'm not here if I'm traveling then I would let you know but please uh, uh, put it in your calendars that every Saturday uh, in summer we want to do it before Maghrib and the reason I wanted to do it before Maghrib one for selfish reasons it's just easier uh, after Maghrib it gets very late but also for your own convenience uh, for the brothers and the sisters especially sisters who have children it's very hard to do it late in winter inshallah ta'ala we will do it straight after Maghrib we will discuss the time so that it's suitable because sometimes Maghrib is very very early and we'll probably maybe push the lecture to just before Isha, maybe 40 minutes or half an hour before Isha. But we will talk about that as we go. So it is a series of lectures. And uh, in order to gain the maximum benefit, it's advisable that you attend every of those lectures, inshallah ta'ala. The topic of these lectures is the purification of the heart. And the purification of the heart is a very, very important topic for us as Muslims and for people as humans. Sadly, in today's modern world, focus on the spirituality of the human being has been minimized. So when our children go to schools or when adults go to universities or when we go to workplaces or when you turn the TV on, or when you, uh, you know, open the newspaper or the new, whatever it is, even in the social media, there is hardly any emphasis anymore on the importance of the ruh or the spirit or the spiritual aspect of the human being. Islamically speaking, the ulama said that a human being is made up of three fundamental components or aspects. A human being is made up of three fundamental and important aspects. And Muslims need or humans need to pay attention to each of those in a balanced way. If you look after one at the expense of the other, you will become imbalanced as a human being. The first of those is the aql, the intellect. As human beings, we are distinguished from other creation by the aql or the intellect that Allah Ta'ala has given us. That's number one. The other aspect that is so important is the physical body, right? So we are made of aql, but we have also the physical body, which is very important that needs to be looked after. And thirdly and importantly, the ruh or the soul. And that is also perhaps one of the most important aspects, looking after the soul and the ruh. Uh, this world and it's the materialism of this world makes the ruh very tired. In fact, you will probably notice when you go to the shopping mall, for example, with all the artificial lights and all the markets and the shops, I don't know about you, but I feel very exhausted when I go to a shopping mall and when I come out. But also when you walk in the cities or the CBDs with all the artificial, uh, artificiality of this modern world, the soul becomes so deprived and so tired. That's why 
it wants to rest at night. One of the fundamental reasons for sleeping, which Allah Ta'ala has created, is to allow the ruh to gain some rest. And that's why Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran that sleep is the, is the sister of death in fact. And Allah says in the Quran, some souls, when you're asleep, the souls travel in, in the world of the unseen. Some souls are returned back and the person wakes up. And some souls do not turn, come back and the person never wakes up. He dies or she dies. But you feel rested. Why? Because the soul gets tired of the material world that it lives in. And it wants to be nurtured. And you cannot nurture the soul with the physical and the material aspects of this world. You can nurture your physical body with those things, but not the soul. So a human being is made up of the intellect, of the physical body, and of the, the ruh or the soul. Islam has paid attention to all of these aspects, but we as Muslims have failed to pay attention in a balanced way to those aspects. And so in today's modern world, I would argue that perhaps we have paid too much attention to the intellect, and in some cases to the physicality, but very little attention to the spiritual. And that's why we live in a world where humans are very much imbalanced. So the topic of the tazkiyatul nufus, the purification of the souls or the hearts, has always been very significant and important for Muslims. Historically, ulama have written so much on this topic. But it is very little, there is very little discussion around it. And so what we want to do, inshallah ta'ala, in the next five, six months, is look at this issue. So what I want to do in these lectures, inshallah, one is to talk about the importance of the heart in Islam. I'm not going to talk about the aql, the intellect, although sometimes we would refer to it but the importance of the heart. Why is the heart so important from an Islamic worldview perspective? Then we want to talk about the types of hearts. And so that you and I can start reflecting on what type of heart do you have? But also then we want, we want to talk about the spiritual diseases of the hearts, which is so important, right? Humans, you may suffer from a physical disease and immediately you rush to the doctor to, be, to get cured. Nobody tolerates physical illnesses. But for some reason, spiritual diseases have been neglected. And all of us, without exception, sadly, are inflicted with some sort or sorts of physical diseases. And what I want to do, inshallah ta'ala, in these lectures, is look at some of those physical diseases such as hasad, envy, or bughd, hatred, right? Or, uh, or miserliness, or stinginess. These are all spiritual diseases, right? Uh, discrimination, racism, uh, having doubts about Allah Azza wa Jal, having doubts about the promises of Allah Ta'ala, right? These are the result of spiritual diseases that we will, we would like, we will cover inshallah Ta'ala. And importantly, we want to talk about what are some of the cures of these diseases. If we are inflicted with the disease of hasad, envy, and you know what? Most people today are envious. You see somebody that Allah gave somebody more than you and you don't feel a sense of joy for them, but you feel, why them? Why Allah gave them, not me? In fact, nations fight one another because of hasad, of jealousy. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, envy or jealousy destroys good deeds like fire destroys dry grass. And if you or I have this disease of hasad, for example, we have to be so mindful that we should not leave this world with that disease. But we should make an effort to try to, to eliminate those diseases from our hearts. 
So the intention that you should have and I should have when you are sitting in these reminders, I don't pretend, I'm not a alim, I'm not a big sheikh, I don't pretend to be. I'm just here to remind myself and remind you. But the intention is very important. What is your intention for being here? إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Rasulullah says beautifully, all actions depend on intentions. Intention should be that we want the islah of ourselves. We want to purify our hearts and rectify ourselves. No one is perfect. And we are commanded to refine our souls and ourselves in this world. And that's what we want to be, what we will be talking about and discussing inshallah ta'ala. So why is the heart important? Al-qalb, the word al-qalb, and there are multiple variations for the word heart that is found in the Qur'an. The most commonly used word in the Qur'an for heart is qalb. And it has multiple meanings. But the word qalb is used 140 times in the Qur'an. And in some instances, this is what Allah Himself, who created this human being, this is what He says to us about the qalb. In this ayah in Surah Ash-Shu'ara, for example, Allah Ta'ala says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ and pay attention to, to this ayah because Allah Ta'ala says in this ayah on the day of judgment nothing will be of help to you not your wealth or your children <coughs> except if you come to Allah with a sound heart I mean this is Allah saying this He says nothing will benefit you on the day of judgment but the only thing that will benefit you is coming to Allah with a sound heart. So the, the obvious question that we should be asking is what? What do you think the obvious question is? If Allah says, the only thing that will benefit you on the day of Qiyamah is a sound heart. Qalb salim, salim, sound. What is the obvious question that we should be asking? What is a salim heart? Ya Allah, how do I make my heart salim? And imagine if you are a university student, for example, and they, they would tell you that you will not pass and you will not be given your degree unless you do this. Will you do it? You will do it. Now Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, is saying to us in this ayah that nothing will benefit you on the day of Qiyamah except coming to Him with a heart that is sound. That is one ayah. Another ayah Allah Ta'ala says, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارٍ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ In Surah Al-Hajj, in verse 46, Allah Ta'ala says, Have these people, and in this case Allah was referring to the people of Mecca, but you can generalize, Have these people not traveled through the land with their hearts to understand and ears to hear? The reference here is to hearts which understand. It is not people's eyes that go blind. Allah says, it's not blindness and not when you lose your eyesight. Allah says, blindness is when the hearts can no longer see. Right? In English, there are two interesting words that often people fail to understand. One is the idea of illusion. And the other word is that of delusion. Illusion and delusion. Illusion is when your eyes fool you. You know, you're walking in the desert, it's a very hot day, you're exceptionally thirsty. 
you looking for water and the eyes fool you and you begin to see an oasis waha water you think there is water but it is the deception of the eyes this is illusion when you think you see something but actually you're not seeing it the eyes are fooling you delusion is when the heart fools you for example when you think you are doing good but actually you are not delusion and this interesting concept in these ayahs again and again allah ta'ala and you will come across this again and again when he says they have hearts but they don't understand they have hearts but they don't comprehend which is interesting because what the quran 1400 years ago told us that the heart as a piece of flesh has the capacity to understand and comprehend and later what i will show you is that only recently medical science began to appreciate and recognize that the heart actually thinks and the heart has the capacity to comprehend in fact before the in, before the brain itself so allah ta'ala is saying you could have all the knowledge in the world you can have the greatest intellect and you can have eyes with which you see and you can have ears with which you hear but if the hearts are blind then you are blind in arabic there are two interesting words that refer to the idea of sight and insight sight the word that is used in arabic for sight is basar 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 means what sight but there is another interesting word in arabic and it's basira which is from the same root word basira is not what the eyes see basar is what the eyes see basira is what the heart sees so a person could have basar but no basira a, po- a person could see with his eyes but they don't see with their heart right and that's why there is a, a huge discussion among scholars about the importance of the intellect versus revelation wahi what is more important the intellect the capacity to be able to to store information and analyze it and what is more important aql or naql wahi revelation and i don't want to confuse you with this discussion today but people who emphasize intellect aql over the importance of revelation and the heart often go astray you know they go astray so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us heart is important fawailun lil qasiyati qulubuhum min dhikri allah ulaika fi dalal mubin surah az-zumar verse 22 allah ta'ala says alas or how unfortunate are those people whose hearts are hardened at the mention of allah why they have clearly lost their way in other words the heart which the heart which is a very soft piece of flesh can actually harden but this hardening is not necessarily physical it is spiritual allah says some people's hearts become hard in another ayah allah ta'ala says alam ya'ni lil ladina amanu an takhsha' qulubuhum li dhikri allah wa ma nazala min al haqq ولا يكون كالذين اوتوا الكتاب من قبلهم فطال عليهم الامد فقست قلوبهم وكثير منهم فاسقون again surah al hadid verse 16 is it not time allah says for believers to humble their hearts to the remembrance of allah and the truth that has come to them and he says don't be like those people who came before you whose hearts hardened and many of them broke the law of Allah because the hearts hardened you know there are some people whose heart is so hard that they have no compassion there is no empathy they are willing to destroy nations for their self interest they can no long no longer see between haq and batil truth and false 
But don't think of these type of people as people who are necessarily outside of the masjid. We can have people in the masjid who are praying five times a day and they have hard hearts. And when we think of compassion and mercy, it's not only towards our humans, but also towards the animals and the environment, for example. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directed us and he guided us, for instance, to be compassionate towards animals. And he felt that people who were harsh towards animals were people who had hard hearts. Imagine today people killing people by the hundreds of thousands. And we say we are civilized. Civilization is not about material progress. Real civilization is when the human being himself has become refined and civilized, so he is connected with Allah, but he is compassionate and merciful to the creations of Allah. And the more a person is connected with Allah, the softer the heart, by the way. And the softer the heart, the easier it is to be forgiving, the easier it is to be compassionate, the easier it is to let go. All you have to do is look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another ayah, Allah ta'ala says, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَةِ In this ayah, Allah ta'ala says, and, and thereafter, in other words, people continue to disobey Allah until Allah says, your hearts become as hard as rocks or even harder. And in the same ayah, Allah says, in fact, some rocks, you see water coming from a rock. Right? But some people's hearts are so hard that they are even harder than rocks. And the scary thing about this is that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and the people who will be furthest away from Allah on the day of Qiyamah, are people who have the hardest hearts. The harder the heart, the further away you are from Allah. The softer the heart, the closer you are to Allah. How's the sound? Is the sound okay at the back? Yes? In another ayah, I'm just trying to emphasize the significance of the heart as Allah Ta'ala Himself tells us. Awalam يَهْدِ لِلَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْأَرْضَ مِنْ بَعْدِ أَهْلِهَا أَلَّوْ نَشَاءُ أَصَبْنَاهُمْ بِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَنَطْبَعُ عَلَى قُلُوبِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ In this ayah, Allah Ta'ala says, Is it not clear to those who inherit the land from former generations that we can punish them too for their sins? Allah says, don't think, in other words, don't think that because you are now more advanced and more progressive and you have bigger armies and you have more wealth and you have bigger buildings that we cannot destroy you like we have destroyed those who came before you. Allah says, I can do it. Then He says in the same ayah, not only does Allah says, I am able to destroy you like I destroyed them, but I can also seal up your hearts so that you can no longer hear. Which is interesting also, the idea of listening and the heart. Because in the Islamic worldview, what the ulama say, the one thing is listening. Sometimes we listen. You know you're listening, sitting in the khutbah, and you are hearing what the imam is saying, but you're not understanding what the imam is saying. You are listening to some sound coming from the imam's mouth. But because the heart sometimes is hard, it's a vessel that is not receiving. And one of the best examples I heard from some ulama about the heart and its softness and hardness is the example of the land that you want to use and harvest, plant in and harvest. If you go, if you, you want to plant, let's say, oranges, or whatever it is, and you go to a land that is so hard, it's full of thorns and weeds and rocks, and you throw the seeds on that land, and you water it, and you fertilize it without softening it. 
what are the chances that these seeds will grow? The land will reject it. You are throwing seeds at the land, the hard land, but the hard land is not receiving it. In order for the land to receive the, the seeds and to allow it to be nurtured and grow, you need to do the hard work. Remove the weeds and remove the rocks and remove the thorns and soften the land. Fertilize it, turn it over and then plant the seeds and then water it and then nurture it. And this is not so much different to the hearts which are hard. When the hearts are hard and they listen to maw'idah, advice, khutbah, read the Qur'an, we are hearing but it's not penetrating. It's bouncing back. Why? Because the heart needs to be softened. It needs, you need to work on the heart so that it can begin to comprehend what it hears. That's why it's so important. And it's, it has been so neglected. And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to us in a hadith that is narrated in Bukhari, to further emphasize the importance of the heart. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ala wa inna fil jasadi mudgha, Ida salahat salah al jasadu kulluh, wa ida fasadat fasad al jasadu kulluh. He says, indeed, there is a piece of flesh in the body. If it is corrected, the entire body will be corrected. And if it is corrupt, then the entire body would be corrupt. Indeed, he says it is the heart. He didn't say it's the intellect. He said it's the heart. There is a piece of flesh. If it is fixed, if it's corrected, if it's refined, if it's purified, then the entire body means the actions that this body will do will be also corrected. If the heart is fixed, in other words, then you will start using your eyes in the right way and not in the way that pleases Allah. If the hearts are fixed, then you will use your feet in the right way and you will use your arms and hands in the right way and you will use your tongue in the right way but when the piece of flesh the heart is corrupt then the actions that will emanate or will come from this human being will be also corrupt and the greater the corruption of the physical body or the actions of the human the greater the corruption of his or her heart Take an example, riba, backbiting. How many people in this masjid, put your hand up when I inshallah ask this question, how many of you know that backbiting is haram? Put your hand up. How many people know backbiting is haram? See, even this little young child, he knows it's haram. Every sister, every brother knows backbiting is haram. This next question, don't put your hand up. How many people in this message backbite? The point is this, knowing is one thing, doing is another. The doing only happens when the hearts are fixed. Doing doesn't come when only you know. And this is where there is this argument between the intellect and the heart. There are a lot of people out there who are more intelligent than you and I. They have a lot of intellect. But the nur, the light of hidayah, the light of guidance, guidance has not penetrated their hearts. And so though they know things that they do are not good, they do them why? Because it satisfies the nafs, it satisfies the ego. And there is always this conflict with humans between what the intellect tells them and what the nafs desires. I'll give you an example. Alcoholism. Do you think Australia as a country, as a nation, knows the harms of alcoholism and alcohol? Do you think they know? Of course they do. How much 
research has been done on the harmful impacts of alcoholism on the physical body, on the brains, on the neurons in the brains, on the liver, on relationships, domestic violence, death on the road. Most of the emergencies, emergency cases, especially during you know, festive seasons, are a result of alcoholism. So intellectually, intellectually there's a lot of academic research to tell people how bad and how harmful alcoholism is. And people know it. It's not that they don't know it, they know it. And because they know it, every now and then they will stop you for the random breath testing. Why? Because you should not be drinking more than a certain limit. Why not? Because you could be causing harm for yourself and others. But so what if I do? Well, because it's not good. Then why do you do it? Intellectually, we know 100% it's very harmful. Then why is it done? Why do people do it? Are they so stupid? Are people so dumb and stupid that when you know something is so harmful, yet you continue to do it? This is when desire comes in. This is when nafs comes in. And it doesn't have to be people who drink alcohol. Us also. Intellectually, we know backbiting is haram. That's why intellect by itself is not, is not enough. Knowing is not enough. There are professors, non-Muslim professors at some excellent universities who know more about Islam than you and I. But they have no hidayah, there is no guidance. Intellectually, they know more about Islam than you and I. If they were to sit with you, they can debate you on every aspect of Islam. But there is no nur in the heart. And so the intellect does not benefit. And that's why from an Islamic perspective, in fact, from e in the Eastern traditions, they have always emphasized on spirituality and the importance of the soul and the spirit. It is only in the modern and the pre-modern world, <coughs> i.e. in the last 200 years, because of the so-called enlightenment of the West, which wasn't so much of an enlightenment, that we drifted away from the significance and the importance of the heart and the soul and all the focus is on the intellect. Yes, when you focus on the intellect, you will achieve a lot in terms of materialism. But you will also lose a lot in terms of humanity. And now we are seeing, for example, the consequences of our expansion and progress on the environment. Right? Now we are saying, please, hold on, everybody put the brakes on. We need to be more environmentally conservative. Separate the recycling from the non-recycling. No more plastic, please, because we are killing the oceans. Seriously? Now you are telling us that? Why? Because desire. And you and I have that desire. And unless we bring it to under control, we don't say suppress desire. We say bring it under control. Because we need that desire. You need that desire. The desire to eat, you need it. But control the desire to eat. The desire to have intimate relationships, you need it for procreation. But control that desire. Islam takes the middle path in this regard. It doesn't, on one extreme it says, let your desire loose. And what do they say? Life is short, enjoy it. That's one extreme. The other extreme is suppress your desire so much so that you, don't, you shouldn't even get married. And the sign of sainthood is to be completely detached from this world. You don't have to, to become a good monk. You shouldn't work and you should be isolated from the world and you should not get married. Islam says, no, neither this extreme nor that extreme. The middle is the right way. We have instinctive desires that need to be satisfied and fulfilled, but they must be controlled and not suppressed. Are you with me? They need to be what? Controlled and not suppressed. 
the desire to, to get angry. It's a desire. Anger is, a, is an instinctive desire. If you say kill anger, it's a problem because when you see wrong, how are you going to stop it? When you see oppression, if you don't get angry when you see people dying by the hundreds of thousands in the world, then there is something wrong with you. It's not, the problem is not with anger, the problem is with how to utilize that anger. How do you channel it? And that's not easy. Most of us fail when it comes to that point. When you get angry, how do you control your anger? How do you channel it? And this could only come through purification of the heart. Right? Purification of the heart. Right? And that's why Nabi Wasallam says there is a piece of flesh in the body. I'm trying to impress on your minds the importance of the heart. So when we discuss the diseases of the heart, you appreciate that this is a seriously important matter. Why? Because Allah and His Messenger is telling us that. Rasulullah sallallahu says in a hadith that is famous and that is sahih, that's inna Allah la yanduru ila suwarikum wa amwalikum walakin yanduru ila qulubikum wa a'malikum. Beautiful hadith. And if we were to just apply that hadith in our lives, we will immediately kill racism and prejudice. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah Ta'ala, Allah Himself, does not look at your appearances or your wealth, but He looks at your hearts and your actions. Actions in this case comes before the word hearts because actions are determined by the nature of the heart. Allah does not look at your wealth, nor does He look at your appearances. It's interesting that the hadith says this, because if you look at humanity today, that's how we judge each other. Appearances and wealth. Right? A person could be absolutely corrupt from inside, absolutely far away from Allah Ta'ala, but they've got the looks, and they've got the bucks. Right? And whoa, role models. It is a very serious issue. You know, let me share this with you. I was, some of the parents here, they know your kids come and do applied Islam with me. And I was doing this course, I did it in Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland. One of the modules, and I'm, I was teaching this class year 11 and 12 in an Islamic school in Melbourne and Sydney. Biggest Islamic schools. And I was going to talk about the idea of a role model. And I wanted to introduce the young people to the Prophet ﷺ as a role model. But before doing that, I thought I'll do a simple experiment. I asked those year 10 and 11 and 12 students, they're not children, and some of them have been at these schools for 12 years, 10 years, all their life. I said, take a piece of paper, small one, don't write your name down, but list the three top role models in your life. Who are your best role models? In, in order of preference, I did this exercise in Melbourne to about three classes. So I had in Melbourne about 60 students who did it, and in, in Sydney I had about also three, so in total maybe 200 students. And after they wrote it down, I collected it, and I said I'm going to open these papers and read it out, and let's do a tally. Right? Every time I say so and so, you... First, and I'm sorry to say this to the fathers, the fathers rated the lowest in terms of role models. This is something to think about. Mothers rated as the highest role models, which is excellent. But higher than the mothers were, who do you think? 
the actors and the actresses and the soccer players and the football players and the cricket players. In fact, what was so distressing is that even religious teachers and imams did not feature as role models in the lives of these people. More distressing was the fact that teachers were not role models. In 200, a sample of 200, and I know you can generalize this sample, but it gives us food for thought. 55% only said that Prophet وسلم, is a role model. And then it got worse. In this classroom in Sydney, after we did all of this exercise, a young sister with full hijab, very intelligent young lady who was asking very interesting questions. She said to me this, and I swear to you, and I'm in the masjid. She said to me, excuse me, Dr. Abdullah, if you were not standing in the classroom, we would not put Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as a role model. So I thought I misheard. I said, could you please repeat that? She said the same thing and nobody objected to her. I said, what do you mean? I said, it was an anonymous survey. You didn't put your name down, so there's no fear. She said, no, but your presence makes us feel compelled that we should put Muhammad وسلم, as a role model. But if you weren't in that, and she did, said that three times. Right? Because the, even our children have begun to use, because we do the same thing as parents, the criteria that we use nowadays to judge people is appearances and wealth. And Allah Ta'ala says, I do not look at your appearances and wealth, I look at your hearts and your actions. Allah x-rays the heart. In the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يُحْصَدُ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ Allah says, on the day of judgment, the hearts will be harvested. Can you imagine the scene? He didn't say the intellect will be harvested. He says the heart will be harvested. So from this ayat of the Quran and the few ahadith that I have mentioned, clearly there is a huge emphasis on the heart in Islam. And that's why we want to focus on the heart for the next six months inshallah and look at the heart as the place of belief the heart as the place of disbelief the heart as the place of hypocrisy the heart as the place of love the heart as the place of hate envy malice hatred jealousy stinginess, miserliness, anger, and how might we, how might we help one another? Inshallah, focusing on that and fixing it, inshallah. What time is the adhan? Three minutes. So we, inshallah ta'ala, I wanted to do, I wanted to touch on more things tonight, but we ran out of time. What I want to do next week, inshallah ta'ala, because we only have three minutes, so you can go and make wudu if you need to make wudu and so on. From next week, I want to speak about physiologically, physiologically, how is the heart viewed now? And some of the correlation between physiological understanding in neuroscience, for example, today, they have recognized that the heart has neurons if not more, at least as much as the neurons in the brains. And that the heart actually, when the embryo is created in the womb of its mother, before even the brain is created, it's the heart that is created, and the heart that starts pumping, before even it's given instruction by the intellect. Because until very recently, it was common belief that the heart or the entire body requires the instruction, the impulses to come from the, the brain. What physiologically neuroscience is telling us today, actually the heart thinks independently of the brain and in many times or at times it sends messages to the brain. And this is not so inconsistent consistent with what we understand in Islam that the heart actually thinks. And the heart possibly can be more important, right? 
And so we want to look at physiologically this, the importance of this heart and then begin inshallah ta'ala to talk about what are some of these diseases of the hearts. You know, if you are a man or a woman, a human being, a Muslim, a Muslima, and you have worked on your life to fix your spiritual heart, to rectify yourself, to refine yourself as a human being. But then Allah tested you with a physical illness, any physical illness. And you were not cured of this physical illness in this world and you died and left this dunya with a physical illness but a clear and a clean heart. Then you have succeeded. You have triumphed. Because physical illnesses will no longer be there on the day of Qiyamah. Post death, physical life means nothing. It's that spiritual and so it's the heart that Allah looks at. On the other hand, if you live your life with a heart that is sick, a heart that is full of envy and malice and hatred and jealousy and arrogance, and you are perfectly physically fit, you run marathons and you cycle up Norton Summit and you jog and you, you eat like a horse and you run like a God knows what. You are physically fit and physically healthy, sharp eyes, sharp ears, excellent intellect. You are almost like Superman, but the heart is sick, arrogant, proud, self-conceited, jealous, full of hate. You think you are the center of the world and you leave this dunya in that state of being ruined on the day of Qiyam. Absolutely ruined. Why? Because we come back to the first ayah in the Quran, where Allah, the first ayah that we recited, where Allah Ta'ala says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ Salim on the day of Qiyamah, on the day of judgment, it is not wealth, it is not children that will be of any help to you. In fact, your child will run away from you. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِيهِ On the day of Qiyamah, Allah says, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ You run away from your brother. وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ And you will run away from your mother and father. وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ And you will run away from your spouse and your children. You will physically run away from them. Why? Allah says, because everybody has their own concerns to worry about. But if you come to Allah, if we come to Allah with a heart that is sound, then inshallah there is no concern. Inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Adhan, yes? You want to call it then? Uh, sorry, I didn't have. Le next, what I'll do next week is allow for some time for question and answer. I do apologize. Uh, and can we start on time maybe next week, inshallah? 7 30, Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah fikum. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika tabaraka smuka ta'ala jadduk. La ilaha gayruk Allahumma wa fillana dhunubana wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawafana ma'al abrar. Wa salli Allahumma wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma asifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.